I am going to start things with someone, a great storyteller who I have had the deep pleasure of performing live on stage before uh, through the moth. She is a special education teacher, activist, writer, and storyteller who fights for her students, public education, teachers, unions, unions tenants' rights, and Asian American issues, just working to organize for a better world. She's currently working on her first memoir. I am so excited to hear that. Uh, and hopes to write an epic book one day about her family and Asian American history. Please welcome our first storyteller, Annie Tan, everybody. Hey, everyone. Uh, so I just want to say something I've learned very well over Zoom is um, that uh, just how to make kids laugh over Zoom because I'm teaching remotely and in person right now. Um, so just to go off what Ophelia said, um, I always introduce myself first as a special education teacher and my orientation toward teaching shifted on the very first day of school when I was 22 in uh, 2011, when I walked into the classroom trying to be super strict and like, you know, uh, pretend like I knew what I was doing when a student threw me totally off my fake game and was like, Miss Tan, will you be our teacher next year? And I was like, what kind of question is that from a third grader? Um, and I learned like soon after that, that she had had three special education teachers uh, the last school year. And she was looking for someone consistent and stable and someone who would stay with her. And you know, I, I just shrugged in the moment and I said, of course, of course, of course, I'm going to be your teacher next year. You know, what do you say to that? Um, and, you know, that really shifted things for me. Like I am more than just like a body in the room. I, I am this person who's going to give my all to my students. Um, and so I vowed that first day of school, I would do everything in my power to make sure my students could read because a lot of my students were like four grade levels behind in reading, couldn't add or subtract numbers, didn't even know their numbers. And I wanted to do my best. You know, I was in Chicago, a brand new city. I had just started a program called Teach for America that places uh, recent college grads into uh, schools, districts uh, where they can't find teachers. Um, and then I was in the South side of Chicago and you know, I wanted to do my best. Um, but I found out very quickly that it was going to be extremely difficult. Um, my first period class had five grade levels of students. I was servicing five grade levels, kindergarten through fourth grade, reading and math, which meant I had to prepare 10 lessons every day. And my first period class had a kindergartner, a first grader, four second graders, two third graders, and two fourth graders, all trying to learn how to read. I have a kindergartner over here learning his letters, a fourth grader who's like, why is there a kindergartner in my classroom? And I had no idea what to do. So I just planned the hell out of that class. And I worked seven days a week when I wasn't doing also grad school work toward my teacher's license and my master's degree. Um, I, I would work easily like 13, 14 hour days when the custodian would kick me out of the school at 9.30 after I was printing out books um, and trying to just figure out a way to be able to teach all my students in all their grade levels. Um, and, you know, that, that was the only way you could do your first year teaching, you know, just trial by fire, you know, but I just felt my body getting weaker and weaker. I remember like actually a, a Facebook post uh, from 2011 today told me that I wanted to take a sick day today, today, October 24th, 2011, but I couldn't. And I was just like, I just have to get to Thursday. I have to finish what I'm doing, but I'm sick. I got three sinus infections that first year teaching and my asthma was acting up. And it wasn't, it was acting up in a way that I hadn't since I was a teenager when right after September 11th, I uh, was born and raised here in Chinatown. We were a mile away. And my asthma got so bad that there was uh, one spring when I was a teenager that I uh, was off school for a whole week. And I had to be on a nebulizer for months, uh, breathing in vaporized saline 
so that my lungs could actually breathe and open up. Um, and I was like, I, I, have, I have to take care of myself, but I also need to do everything for my students, right? Um, but how, how could I do everything when, you know, I would plan these well-prepared, aka crappy lesson plans, uh, and then I go into school the next day and find out like a kid has had some family member in the hospital or they were suspended because they brought a toy gun into school or um, just all these issues that kept coming up uh, from the home environment or the school environment or with another student bullying another student and at lunch, you can't do a lot. Um, and I, I was not giving, I could not teach that group. And my supervisor knew it. And in April, I was put on an improvement plan and then summarily fired for not improving enough within a month span. Um, and I thought, I was like, am I cut out for this? Is, am I going to be a teacher? I'd wanted to be a teacher all my life. The only reason I'd done Teach for America in the first place was because there was a hiring freeze after the recession and I couldn't get a job here in New York City where I'm from. Um, and for the first time in my life that summer, I realized I have to take care of myself. And so I took the next year off to get my master's degree and to be a paraprofessional assistant and to actually heal from the physical and mental anxiety and frustration that I felt and had taken in from my students that year. That was the best decision I'd ever made in my life to take that time off for myself. Um, and when I went back to teaching, I went back in roaring. I was in a public school with a union and where I could actually fight for my rights now for my students. Uh, and I learned from the Chicago Teachers Union Special Education Committee that everything I was doing in that charter school was illegal. You don't teach five grade levels in one class. That's not done. <laughs> um, I was like, oh my God, like I had blamed myself for two years thinking that it was my fault that I couldn't teach these kids, but it was the conditions and the resources that weren't given to the kids, you know, and even though this public school wasn't perfect, like we had a nurse for half a day um, on a Thursday morning. And that was the only time we had a nurse in a public school. And one of my students happened to have an accident where he was bloody everywhere and had the nurse not been there that morning. And had it not been a Thursday morning, he would have been rushed to the ER by himself, a second grader. Um, I knew I had to fight back. So I co-chaired that special education committee for two years. We fought back against budget cuts and staff cuts and we won. We won back hundreds of positions and made Chicago public schools hire back 150 teachers instead of cutting positions. Because we fought back as a collective, we went on strike together. Like we as a school school fought together and it just felt like we could make a difference, you know? But I, you know, again, lots of sinus infections, lots of upper respiratory tract infections and lots of asthma issues because I just, again, spent 13 hour days, maybe not on lesson planning as much because I was getting better as a teacher, but on the fight. I moved back to New York City four years ago uh, to be closer to home and during this coronavirus, uh, crisis, you know, I spent the spring like sending mail to parents um, through my own dime and uh, mailing, mailing papers for the kids who didn't have Wi-Fi or devices who waited seven weeks for computers. Um, and we did our best to like make the most out of it. I like even bought these masks, like, so like when we went back in person, maybe that they would be able to see me smile even though they would see the spit, it would be so much fun, you know? Cause we go out of our way always as teachers. But this summer we saw there wasn't enough being done. We still didn't know if there would be a nurse in every school in New York City. We didn't know if there'd be PPE supplies. We didn't know about ventilation, you know? And then New York City Public School said, all you need is an open window and that's enough ventilation for what? For a kid sitting for five hours in a classroom on mass eating lunch. So we fought back like, you know, and I with the movement of rank and file educators, the more caucus of the teachers union here in New York City, we had protests and rally social distance and masked up um, to fight back. I was interviewed in almost every New York City publication about um, this. And still there were so many 
unanswered questions. And then even after two, like two delays from the mayor, we went back. And I found myself the first day of school again, you know, one of my students asked, you know, I had this mask and I had a face shield on and a student asked me during lunch, like, Miss Tan, why are you wearing that face shield? You don't need to, like, we're okay. And it, it broke my heart that I was looking at this kid like he was a vector. Like he was the one who could give me coronavirus or I could give it back to him. Um, and I had only, since September 29th, I've only seen my students five times. I go into the school building on terrible Wi-Fi to do a remote session like this. And it makes no sense. Hey. And Amanda. thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what's it called? I am okay now. Um, but I decided with my asthma, um, you know, I, it's been freezing in my classroom with just the open window, you know, even 55 degree windows, like 55 degree weather, like, uh, we've been wearing sweaters and jackets inside and I can't imagine what it's going to be like below freezing. Um, and my asthma always acts up during the cold. And so I decided for the first time in my life as a teacher, really to put myself first. And I applied for a medical accommodation October 29th. As of today, October 25th, I still haven't gotten word whether my medical accommodation was approved or not. And they haven't approved people for weeks, just showing much more that the Department of Education doesn't care about teachers in my mind. But you know, I said earlier that I always introduce myself as a teacher first. Now I'm starting to learn that I, in order to keep up this fight, in order to stay a teacher, I have to learn to be a human first. Thank you for listening. Annie, Tan, everybody. Okay, just amazing. And I feel like, uh, you know, the term gaslighting is something I feel like I've only learned that term maybe in the last five years, but I feel like that is a huge part of what you had to deal with feeling like is this wrong and then finding out later that yeah basically it was totally wrong uh, and just you know I know it's in a different context but just when you were saying like I need to put myself first it always which I'm totally agree in agreement with of course and even as a, a mother who um you know, for uh, I have a five-year-old, and you know, my joke is when this all started, I was like, "Wow, this is my first child. This is my only child." And I was like, "You know what? Nobody told me as a mother I would have to raise my child. Okay, nobody told me that." Uh, but the but the truth is too, like I've learned that I have to put myself first occasionally, or the whole house of cards falls down. And you know that thing when we used to fly, remember when we used to fly and they go through the emergency protocol and get to the masks and what do they always say? They always say, put yours on first. They always say that. Uh, and I think about that all the time. That was, that was just incredible, Annie. Thank you so much for your story. Our next storyteller is a super mom of two which as I only have one, I'm gonna consider that at least double, maybe quadruply as hard. Uh, she is a motivational mentor trauma, superhero speaker, teaching others how to strive for a full life of positivity and happiness. Please welcome and clap it up for our next storyteller, Megan Richter, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here <laughs> virtually. So. Uh... Growing up, going to my grandma's in Michigan was something I look forward to so much. I mean, my grandma was the one person I really felt got me, she understood me, and I loved it. I went up there every summer since I was born. I started flying up there alone once I was six. You know, I went almost every winter. I grew up in South Florida, so the difference in going to the country in Michigan, as I'm sure you can imagine, is just completely night and day, <laughs> you know, down here. I'm, you know, living a fast lifestyle and up there, I get to, you know, go ATVing, we're hunting, fishing. If I want something to eat, we go down to the garden and get it. You know, it's nothing they eat is store-bought. It's completely fresh and I love it. My grandma and I used to, you know, make these amazing apple pies together. We would literally go down to her garden and pick the apples 
make them from scratch. So going up there was something I really enjoyed. So when I found out this summer, uh, the summer before my sophomore year of high school, that I was not going, I was very upset, especially when I found out that my mom's summer plans were still going to continue. So now I'm going to be, you know, left unsupervised, but with plenty of financial resources. And I'm upset that I'm not seeing my grandma. So you can imagine, <laughs> I enjoyed myself really well. I had already been in some trouble already. I dropped out of high school and was doing a lot of drugs and hanging out with some older people. So to have a whole summer to basically do whatever I want, I really took advantage of that. So unfortunately, by the time my mom came home, things had really gotten out of control. I am now, I've committed some check fraud. The police are a little bit involved. So my dad calls me and he's like, you know what? <laughs> Maybe we should go visit your grandma. And instead of you going alone, why don't we go together? I'm going to take you, you know, actually um, my aunt Diane and them are going to go to Missouri and visit my cousin and his wife, you know, and things like that. So why don't we just make a nice family time of it? I'm like, okay, that's fine. I haven't seen my dad in almost a year. We don't really talk that much. So I'm like, oh, this sounds kind of nice. You know, like I get to see my grandma. I'm very excited about that. I really need a hug and just, like it has been a very difficult time. Like I said, you can imagine at 15, already going through so much stuff. I'm, you know, hanging out, involved in gangs. I'm going to clubs a lot. So to have that break was something I really genuinely look forward to and just mentally needed to go do. And thought it could sign it sounded somewhat nice. And my dad was like, oh, you know, it's been a tough time, Meg. Let's take some time together and get away. So he picks me up from my mom's house after a horrible weekend, which is a whole other story. And basically I, you know, slam the door in her face. I could care less. I'm so excited to get out of there. He's like, don't you want to say, you know, I love you or goodbye. And I'm like, no, no, let me go see my grandma. Let's just go. I am ready. So we take off, we head to St. Louis, Missouri. And, you know, the flight there is pretty, you know, normal and things like that. But I noticed while he's getting the rental car, he has a lot of bags. I'm like, why do you have so much stuff? He's like, oh, it's some hunting gear, you know, for grandpa and for Dirk. And they asked me to bring it. It's just easier instead of, you know, shipping it to just bring it now. Like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So we go and get some Wendy's. And afterwards, he's like, you know, it's a long drive. Why don't you just go ahead and lay down in the back seat, and, you know, and I'll just drive. I'm like, okay, I'm pretty tired. So it doesn't take me long to just, you know, pass out. When I wake up though, I realized like we have been driving a very long time and there is nothing around. I'm like, where are we? They live in a college town. She's going to medical school. So there's a lot of stuff that's usually happening, happening, but there's nobody. There's no cars. There's just like forests and trees everywhere. So I'm like, I don't understand what's happening. So I climbed to the front seat and he's like, wait, when have you ever been there to see them before? I was like, oh, a few years ago, I went with grandma and grandpa to visit. And this is not how it looked. And he's like, oh no, they moved recently. It's okay. There's like some RV park and some cabins. We're going to go check in. We're pretty close. I'm like, okay. So as we start to pull up this driveway, you don't really see anything, but then you start to see a few like scattered houses and a couple like RVs here and throughout. And then we pull it to this like large, it looks like a giant wooden cabin. My dad tells me to go ahead and leave my stuff in the car. Everybody's inside. We're gonna go kind of get checked in. And then there's more stuff kind of around back and we're gonna see everybody. Okay, honestly, I'm just so excited to see my grandma and it has just been so much going on that I kind of am really just distracted to just let's go. Let's hurry and get in. And where are they already? <laughs> so as we walk up the steps, we walk in and it's this huge heavy door and it kind of slams behind us. Before I can even realize what's happening, I kind of turn and notice in front of me is a large group, large girls and a large group of them. And before I can even like grasp what's happening, my dad is pulled into this other room. And I'm like, oh my God, dad, are you okay? Grandma, and I'm like yelling for my grandma, for my dad, and this, and I turn around real quick. I'm trying to open the front door that we came in, but it's just spinning. Like the doorknob is not opening at all. I'm like, oh my God. And it's, I'm trying so hard as I can to get out. I'm like in a horror movie, you know? And before I know it, this 
creepy dude like pops up out of nowhere. He takes my shoulders and spins me around. And he's like, Megan, and I'm just staring at these girls who are now kind of like coming around me. He's like, you're going to go downstairs with these girls while I talk with your dad for a little bit. I'm like, dad, dad, what are you talking about? Hello, where's my grandma? What are you talking about, you weirdo? And I begin to start like fighting these girls. You know, I'm like, what the fuck's happening? What's going on? And he lets me know is they basically slam me down to the ground that I have the option to go forcefully or willingly. That he's going to be talking to my dad about some things and I need to listen and go with these girls. No. So I'm screaming and basically they hold me down even tighter. And he reiterates to go forcefully or willingly. Before I even realize what's happening, they basically stand me up to my feet and are kind of like guiding me like I'm floating through this dining hall because there's so many of them and I weigh practically nothing for them. We go down this creepy basement <laughs> stairwell and I'm just like trying to take in what's happening. I'm not sure where my grandma and grandpa are, <laughs> like where is my dad? And as we go through this, you see just large bunk beds all over the place and one chair with six chairs circled around it. They let me know I need to go ahead and sit down, <laughs> that my dad will be a while and they're gonna start going over some of the rules and just let me know some of the stuff. Some of the things they begin to tell me just sound insane. First of all, they speak exactly alike and they're dressed identical. They are head to toe. You can't see any skin. They let me know that even the word shorts is not allowed. You wear culottes, there's no leaving. We go to church 24 seven. Women are nothing. We're there to serve men. And they are just going on and on about all this stuff that makes me just want to vomit and have a nervous breakdown. I'm 15 and I'm used to just like rollerblading and surfing and living my own life with no parental supervision. And now these people are telling me I'm going to be wearing a skirt basically down to my ankles, quoting the Bible and serving men for the rest of my life. Like this is not happening. <laughs> like there's no way my parents are letting me stay here. You guys have got this all wrong. You're insane. So thank God, finally, actually after five and a half hours of sitting down there listening to this insanity, I see my dad coming and I jump up and I'm like, later ladies, I'm out. Like I'm not staying here. They basically kind of get in front of me and hold me back and I'm like, just wait, your dad's gonna come say goodbye. I'm like, no, he's not. So I see my dad start, I'm like, we need to go. We need to go now, dad. These guys are crazy. You won't even believe the stuff they're saying to me. I see though his face as opposed to where I expect him to be like, come on, Meg, let's go. Or putting his arm around me. He does this more hesitation, puts his arms out and starts to kind of like a patronizing face. Well, Meg, you know, I think this is what, and I'm starting to like, no, no, what do you mean? <laughs> like. I don't want to be here. He puts his hands basically on my shoulders and starts to give me this speech of how things have been so out of control the past year. And this is really what's best for me. And him and my mom have talked about it. I begin to instantly freak out as I'm sure you can imagine. I'm like, no, please. I'm begging you. Like I will do whatever you want. I'll be whoever you want me to be. Like you cannot, like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. These are the weirdest people. You don't understand. I'm like trying to plead with him and scream with him. And he just really is not, I'm not getting anywhere <laughs> and not making any headway. I'm like, dad, you don't understand. They're so weird. I need to go. He's like, Meg, this is really what's best. As I realize I'm not getting anywhere, I begin to start going from pleading and telling him I'll be, you know, the perfect little angel to telling him that honestly, like, I will never forgive you. Like, I don't care if you die. Like, I'll hate you forever. Like, I cannot stay here. They're so weird. Like, I want to go. We need to go. Like, I'm begging you, please. Like, we need to go. He's like, Meg, I'm just not sorry. As I begin to finish and kind of push him away and I'm like screaming and I'm like, dad, I don't want to go. He just turns away and begins to walk out the door. As I'm trying to chase him, they basically slam me down to the ground and I'm screaming and crying and I can't even like take in everything that's happening. I'm asking them to please give me a moment, but before I can even get a chance, they take me into the hallway, strip off all of my clothing and jewelry and put me in a cold shower. They basically deloused me and welcomed me to my new home. I was stuck there for five years and I had to endure cancer while I was there. Thankfully, it has taught me to become an amazing mom and to help other people and to be able to recognize the pain in others that most can't tell.
Thank you so much. Wow. Oh my goodness, everybody. Megan Richter, please, that is, obviously there is, um, I mean, what you, you just told us a eight minute story, of course, that is a huge story, but I, uh, I am both, I'm humbled uh, by you, and also, um, I mean, I, I'm very happy that you're here Thank telling you. the story. I will tell you that I'm very happy that you're here telling the story, uh, and somehow you have done the impossible, which is you you created something beautiful out of something traumatic yep. um, with your with your life. Uh, and I'm so sorry that on top of that, you had to deal with cancer. Um, yeah, and um, you know, just for whatever reason, because you shared so much, I will say I am also a cancer survivor. And you know, I was just today walking by one of my least favorite places that I used to spend a lot of time at, Quest Diagnostics. Oh, Quest Diagnostics. Uh, if you know Quest Diagnostics, it is you. I, it is weirdly the most casual medical environment on the planet. It is usually a strange storefront. You walk in and the door hits like a wind chime. You're like, was this a deli last week? Uh, the person that you know who's like putting new toner into the fax machine. You're like, hey, I'm here for a blood test. They're like, yeah, that's me. You're like, really? Do, do, you, want, do you wash your hands between the toner? Like they fish out a syringe from a pencil case. There's like highlighters and stuff in there. I mean, it is is ridiculous. There's no diplomas. Next time you're in a Quest Diagnostics, try to find one little bit of accreditation. There's nothing. There's nothing. There's lockup instructions. Like it's a bar. That's it. <laughs> It's one of the weirdest places. Even has carpet on it sometimes that you're like, you're like, is that cat hair? I mean, it is. It is a casual medical environment. Um, that was an incredible story. Thank you again. Uh, tonight we have a couple people that are storytellers, but they are doing tributes. Uh, and this next guy, you may know him because for the past eight years he's been working at Community Roots Charter School in Brooklyn, and he has helped organize existing family programs, developing new programs for students and their families to engage in. And he currently serves as the coordinator of community programs and recruitment. He is also the co-founder of this incredible show, Unreally, Unreeling Storytelling, and an, and an active Run for Justice leader, pushing to spread out love equally to all. What a pleasure. Jason Fulford, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody that's joining us. Um, it really, you know, these events are really special and important to Devin and I. And I think after just hearing our first two stories, you get a sense of why it's so important. And we really wanted to highlight, you know, um, educators, but also to highlight women age educators who are extremely important and have played such an important role in education and continue to. And it's actually one of the reasons why I went into education because I didn't see enough males, but my mom was an educator and, you know, kind of seeing what could be done by uh, just my presence in schools. Um, I decided to give my all to education and luckily I ended up at Community Roots, which kind of just matched my passion for education and um, one of our uh, storytellers this evening uh, co-founded Community Roots and I'm very thankful for them creating a place that has helped me grow and elevate into not only the educator I am, but going back to what Annie has said, but also like me finding myself. And I wanted to make sure that after you shared your story that, you know, it's still a journey and something that is in progress. But I think that I've been taking more time to find myself so I could be a better educator and be of better service to the youth that I work with on a daily basis. Um, and this person that I am going to speak about, her name is Winnie Birch. And she was a very important person to me because she gave me a opportunity to be involved in her son's life because I met him when I started my education path. I, I started as a counselor for the Boys Club of New York 
And I was doing that work while I was in college. Over the summer, we would go up to New Jersey, this camp called Camp Cromwell. And I met her son, Chad, and he was nine, 10 years old. We've known each other for about 20 years now. I was about 20 years old when I met him. And I became his mentor and big brother. And she just became like a second mother to me. And she wound up being diagnosed with colon cancer and she caught it when it was stage three already. So it was very late in the game. Um, and it just so happens that I met Chad and I didn't know he was in the school that my mom was teaching at, at the time. And so my mom knew him and Winnie. And it just so turns out that when Winnie needed to go to chemotherapy, my mom had just retired and she was able to go to chemo with her. And it just gave her like a point person. And I really just feel that, you know, sometimes things are just meant to happen. And I really feel that this was one of those relationships that was really meant to happen for, for all of us, all parties that were involved but especially for myself, because not only did Winnie give me a lot as being like a second mother, but she gave me a lot of inspiration as someone that was an entrepreneur and she was an artist. Uh, she had some amazing artwork. And even when she got sick, she decided that she was gonna publish a book that she wrote. Uh, it's called Above It All. And you know, it was when she had her book signing when I was beyond inspired by her because I knew what she was going through at that time. And I knew how much she could have let health get in the way of what she truly wanted to do at that time. Like she could have just said, you know what? I'm, I'm not feeling well on a daily basis. Like I could just not do anything and just rest and, and hopefully get better. But instead, she decided to inspire everybody around her until the last time I saw her. And one of the things that made me really wanna tribute her is because even though the cast we have today has experience in education, I think that we all have the power of being educators. And Winnie taught me that because she was one of my biggest educators and we were never in a classroom together. So. You know, she taught me so much about life and not only about life, but how to live life and how to be comfortable with not only the positive things that you do, but also the mistakes that you make in life. And I remember one time we were, uh, this was when Basketball City was uh, next to Chelsea Piers before they um, got rid of that space uh, in Manhattan, New York. And we're walking because me and her son Chad were, were playing and we were walking to go eat some food. And she kind of starts talking to me about how she knows that when I'm not doing well, I avoid her, you know? And I, I'm kind of like, nah, that's not true. That's not true. But in my mind, I know like, you know, how does Winnie know this? Like, I, it's, it's crazy because every time I'm going through something, I'm like avoiding her because she could see right through me <laughs> uh, clearly. And, you know, she says, son, the one thing I want you to do is just be comfortable with the decisions you make. Like, I I'll never judge you for any mistakes that you make and I'll always be here for you. Like, you can always come to me. And, you know, I I'm, I'm someone who I think I, I keep a lot inside and that's why unreeling and what Devin and I have started has become such a big part of my life and a passion is because I wanna not only let more out for myself and my personal healing, but I want other people to know that it's okay, you know? And we all have or make decisions that might not be the best at that moment, but everything shapes us into the people that we become. And Winnie was just that person in my life that really pushed me to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And, you know, she's a big reason that I've been doing everything that I've been doing lately uh, because I really wanna honor her the right way. And I know she's, you know, with me. Uh, she gives me strength daily. Um, and I'll never forget uh, when I ran my first marathon, she wasn't feeling well. And um, 
she couldn't really be part of the crowd, but she went to a spot uh, that the marathon was passing by uh, with her daughter, Marion, my big sister, well, my sister. And, uh, you know, I, I just remember how proud she was of me accomplishing that. And I'm just gonna make sure that I continue to try my best to inspire people. And, you know, when you see me doing my thing, I just want everybody to know that that's Winnie, that's right there by my side and pushing me to do so. Like some other people that I know are right by me and watching over me right now. But um, I just wanted to say, Winnie, I love you. And, you know, my daughter Alyssa loves you and we miss you. And it was my brother Chad's birthday the other day. And, um, you know, happy birthday, Chad. You're a wonderful young man. And Winnie, you know, really did her best to raise three amazing kids, uh, Alexia, Marion, and Chad. Um, and thank you for being such a big part of my life. And that's all I have. Thank you. Amazing. I mean, just amazing. Jason. Jason, everybody, you know, um, I don't know if you saw this, Jason Wall, you, uh, when you said this, but I, I'm looking at also everybody's reaction. And when you said that you would avoid Winnie when you were like not at your best, there was, I mean, it rang so true to me to my own behavior, but I felt like even through Zoom, I saw people going like, yep, yep. Yep, 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 yep. Like that, like we avoid, when we, we avoid the people that could help us the most, you know, sometimes. Uh, and also I, I wrote down this line, but my, I, I have a good friend who is on this. I'm so a wonderful storyteller too, Jen Singer. Uh, and when you said it, I was like, that is so right. Uncomfortable, comfortable with being uncomfortable. The ability to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I mean, that is, that is one of the hugest lessons in life. And so thank you for that amazing tribute. Uh, I also have shared the stage with, he is a writer and three-time Moth Story Slam champion. His stories have been featured all over the place, including the Washington Post, the Moth Podcast, National Public Radio on KNKX, Speak Up Storytelling, and more. He is also the founder of Unreeling Storytelling. Uh, David is also working on his first book, which I'm, I'm so excited to hear about these people's books. This is a great time to write a book if you have the gift of health. Um, and his memoir is short stories, removing the curtain of race to reveal the hard truths about the emotional and psychological pain that is felt when you are treated lesser than. Uh, here with a tribute, Devin Sanford, everybody. Thank you. I uh, actually was not going to do anything other than just like being behind the scenes. And Jason um, had this great idea about doing a tribute. Um, and when he came to me, it immediately struck me what he wanted to do. And knowing, of course, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but that, you know, cancer being more than breast cancer, um, it struck me that he wanted to do this. And I did not want to do this for a very specific reason. And it's because uh, somebody very close to me, just like with Jason, had passed away recently, actually a year ago this last Sunday from ovarian cancer. And this person was very special to me. And, and even with her being so special, I didn't want to do a tribute. Uh, I just felt it was too fresh. Um, and the reason that I decided to change my mind actually is I thought about our theme, education. And uh, this woman is my two best friends, mom from elementary school, twins we met in the second grade. And every year we got closer and closer. And when I thought about education being the theme, uh, so much of her life was dedicated to education, going and getting degrees of her own, but helping out people as she was the director of academic publishing at a major university. And so she helped people write their thesis and all these things. And the moment that really pushed me over the top where I wanted to give a moment to speak about her was when I thought about the education that she provided to me. So her two boys were going and they were gonna do some SAT prep. And my family, they're all in the academics. My dad's a teacher, my dad has a PhD, my mom has a PhD, my sister has a PhD. And 
But for some reason, I was not doing any SAT prep in high school. And so when the twins went to go do their SAT prep, their mom pulled me aside and said, you're doing it too with them. And like, just brought me in like I was one of her sons. And they're actually on the, the Zoom with us today. And so I just wanted to give a chance to show the reason that I wanted to do a tribute to Dr. Howard. I know her, of course, as Mrs. Howard or sometimes mom. Um, and when I thought about how much she impacted people's academics, I knew that I had to give you tri a tribute to how important she was for my life personally, and that I would not have had any SAT prep if not for her. So that's it. Yes. <laughs> Devin, thank you. I'm so glad you decided to do that. I know that you were like a little back and forth because you just mentioned that to me in an email. So, yeah. but I guess uh, that's like, so not only, um, you know, I, I like that we talk about people who impacted us so that Jason also impacted you. Yes, he yeah. absolutely did. I would not have done that unless he came up with that. So <laughs> good community here, a good community of great, of great people coming together. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next storyteller, you know what? The, the first thing I learned about the storyteller is that she's an anthropologist. And I have to say, as someone who studied cultural anthropology in college and was always told that it was um, not, not a very good thing to study in terms of a career. This person makes me feel like if they are here and I am here, we both did amazing choices with our lives. Uh, she's an anthropologist, a jurist, an author, a performing artist who after a 15 year legal career in the sports and entertainment industry now uses her gifts uh, for in written and spoken word to lend voice to the silenced and lend visibility to those who are overlooked. Uh, she has an amazing blog that you can check out that is uh, filled with her thoughts called That Traveling Black Girl, and we will put that in the chat for you. Please welcome our next storyteller, Adrian Lawson, everybody. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Um, what I learned during Zoom is that I have no idea where these cameras are. So if I look here, look here, look here, it's because I have no idea where to look, okay? So just be patient with me. After a successful career, in the sports industry, I decided I really wanted to help make a difference in the lives of women, particularly African-American women. And I believe the best way to do that was through faith-based initiatives. So I went to seminary and I ended up going to a seminary that really valued experiential learning. They thought this was the best way to receive your education on how to use religion and faith to make a positive impact in people's lives. So I went to a seminary in Atlanta that focused on this. And I got a student internship at an assistant living center in the heart of Atlanta that was owned by a particular denomination. The, the members or the residents, I should say, in this assisted living community were average age 80 years old, overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly female, and all good Southerners. I remember my first day walking into my office, placing my box down and Joni walks in, sits down and begins to chat. Now I only have 15 minutes before I have to go to my first administrative meeting. And I look at Joni and I said, may I help you? And she says, well, I just need to tell you, I'm the pianist at the weekly Bible study. And you're gonna start each Bible study with the 23rd Psalm. And you're gonna end it with singing a walk in the garden. And I thought, okay. And she says, you know, you're going to be a pretty good chaplain. And she gets up and she walks out. As I'm walking to the office for my first meeting, I see a gentleman looking out the window and he strikes me as rather odd. One, he had all of his hair and it wasn't gray. He was the only man I had seen after being there for about 20 minutes who wasn't completely gray. He was also wearing a sweatsuit with a lot of gold chains. And that really didn't fit in the profile of 80 years old in the South in a religious community. But okay, I thought I'll figure out who this guy is later. I go to my first meeting and of course they're telling me the do's and the don'ts, who to visit, who is in the hospital, how I'm supposed to conduct myself. And they said, by the way, that guy over there near the window, his name is Jimmy. And Jimmy's really mean. So don't take it personally when Jimmy is mean to you. He's not very happy here. His family dumped him off. He's 
has terminal lung cancer and he's just miserable. I said, okay, great. So I leave the meeting, I walk over to Jimmy and I said, excuse me, I'm told that you have the mistaken belief that the best pizza in the world is from Brooklyn. And that's just ridiculous. We all know the best pizza in the world is from Manhattan and Queens plays a close second. And he looks up at me, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm the new chaplain. He says, oh, one of those types. Well, what do you want? And I said, well, Jimmy, I just wanted to know, what can I do to help you feel happier here? And he said, booze and broads, booze and broads. Can you do that? I said, no, no, Jimmy, I can't do that. Is there anything else I can do to make you happy? He says, hmm, I also miss gambling. Can you help me with that? I said, Jimmy, I might be able to help you out. So I go to my office and I bring a deck of cards back. I pretend, I lie, to not know how to play poker. And I said, Jimmy, maybe you can teach me how to play poker. He says, man, okay, I guess it's worth the time. I don't have anything else, else to do. So we begin to play poker and I'm pretending not to know how to play poker. And Jimmy gets frustrated. He slams the cards down and he says, this is ridiculous. This isn't any gambling, there's no money. So I said, okay, Jimmy, give me a week to think about this and I'll get back to you. So the next week I show up with my deck of cards and a big jar of pennies. And I said, okay, Jimmy, I got money, let's gamble. And at this point, I showed Jimmy that I know how to play poker. And Jimmy says, pennies, this isn't worth anything. And I said, hey, pennies are money, money's gambling, let's do it. So we, you know, we gamble, we're having a, a great time, the ice has been broken. And he says, hey, do good ministers gamble? And I said, no, not really, Jimmy. He goes, you could get in trouble for this, couldn't you? I said, yeah, pretty much pretty good, Jimmy. He says, hmm, interesting. And he begins to tell me his story about how he was near but not in the mafia. How, you know, he had this great life in New York until his kids brought him to, to Atlanta and then dumped him in this place with all these old broads that look at him like a piece of meat. And I said, my goodness, Jimmy, what a life. And we began to have this ongoing poker game twice a week for the rest of my internship. Well, sure enough, one of the good Southern women reported me to the administrators. They brought me in and they said, you know, as the chaplain, we discourage you from gambling. And I said, listen, Jimmy's doing better. He's talking, he's smiling. That should count for something. And they're like, hmm. So we reached a compromise where at the end of every game, I would collect all the pennies, put them back in my jar and leave them in the office. And they said, watch it, Lotson. We're watching you. I was like, okay, fine. Shortly after the Jimmy incident, the Bible study class revolted. I introduced new scriptures and new songs and the ladies, if they didn't fall asleep, got up and walked out, albeit very slowly. Joni shakes her head and says, oh, and I just hang my head. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm not very good at this job. I get a call to go to the hospital to go visit one of our residents who's not doing well. And I show up at the hospital, I say, I can at least do this well. And I show up at the hospital and I walk in and I say, hello, Mrs. Calloway, I'm here to pray with you. And she gives this great sigh of relief. And I begin to pray with her. When a nurse walks in, she looks at me, she looks at Mrs. Calloway, she looks at me and she said, excuse me, do you realize that you're praying with a dead person? I jump back. No, I say to myself, no, I did not. I touched Miss Calloway's hand, said, bye, Miss Calloway, and got up and walked out. The nurse just shakes her head and walks away, and I just hung my head. I said, Phew, I really suck at this. Can it get any worse? A little while after, I'm doing my hospital rounds, and I get on the elevator, and there's a woman who is sobbing. I mean, she is sobbing. I said, ma'am, are you okay? And she said, no, no, my boyfriend's in a horrible motorcycle accident. He's up in ICU and it's just terrible. And at that point, the door is open because I have gotten to my floor. As I'm stepping off the elevator, I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And in that second, I felt back up and help this woman. After all, you are the chaplain here. So I got back on the elevator. I said, what can I do to help? And she says, oh, he's in ICU. If you could just pray with him, they won't let me go up there. And I, I'm just not gonna leave until he's better. So I said, okay, no problem. So I go up to ICU. I show them my badge, I'm the chaplain, where's the guy who was in the motorcycle accident? They point me towards room eight. I go to room eight and this bed is surrounded by 
doctors and nurses with machines going off and all kinds of sounds and everyone's in conversation. And I walk in the room and a nurse at that moment moved away from the bed to go put her chart somewhere. And I see the man in the bed. I jump back in horror and scream at the top of my lungs, oh my God, what has happened to you? And everyone in the room turns around and the doctor says, who the hell are you? I said, I'm the chaplain. And I show him my little badge. See, I'm the chaplain. He said, get out, get out now. I said, but I'm, he said, get out. So I stand out in the hall and I hang my head down and they continue to do all the things that they're doing. And the doctor, they're leaving the room. The doctor comes up to me and he says, ma'am, that man is on the brink of death. You need to get yourself together. You are supposed to be a professional. Now get it together and go in there and help him. Do not recoil in horror. That does not help anybody. So I was like, okay. So I go in and here this man is, he has no skin on his face at all. His eye is half hanging out of the socket. His teeth are all over the place. His arms are black and blue and purple. And it's just horrifying to look at him. And I said to the nurse, is there any place on his body I can touch him where he won't feel pain? And she points to one of his hands and she says, you can hold this hand. So I take his hand and I said, sir, your girlfriend sent me to pray for you. I met her in the elevator and she wants you to know that she loves you and she's gonna be here until you make it through. And his eyes well up with water. And I pray for him and he begins to cry. And I just hang my head and I said, I am the worst chaplain that has ever done this job. So I go back and other than setting off a fire alarm, losing a resident's cat and getting into other kinds of challenges that required weekly meetings with the staff about what I'm doing wrong, my last assignment before I left was to help out with the funeral of Joni who died in her sleep of a heart attack. And her family is there. Jimmy shows up in a jacket and tie, which shocked me. And all I had to do was read the 23rd Psalm. That was the only assignment they gave me. And I thought, clearly I can do this. This I can do. As I begin to read the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall know why I begin to cry and I begin to sob and I can't stop heaving and sobbing as I try and read the 23rd Psalm, her favorite scripture when her son gets up and throws his arms around me in the middle of the funeral and is comforting me, the comforter. The senior chaplain just shakes her head. And I thought, this is the worst that could possibly happen. A week after I finished, I get a call from the senior chaplain and I'm waiting for her to tell me what a horrible chaplain I am and how I should never do this job ever. And she says, we received a letter from Joni's son and I wanna read it to you. And in the letter he said, that his family has always dealt with the guilt of sending their mother to live in an assisted living center. But when they saw that lady minister break down when trying to read their mother's favorite scripture, they realized how deeply loved she was. And it made them feel so good to know that their mother's remaining years was at a place that loved her so deeply. And enclosed was a check for the largest contribution that the that the living center had ever received. And the senior chaplain said to me, you're not such a bad chaplain, my dear. In fact, you're a pretty good one. Thank you. Oh, Adrian Lawson, everybody. What, I mean, first of all, I just have to point out two very obvious things. What a what a uh un, even through this how charismatic are you your charisma just comes through zoom i leaned in to your story so hard because you're a, just a natural uh and also um i believe i believe that you're an amazing chaplain just by the fact that you are able to make light of such dark stuff you, uh, t I mean, that was a, a, a story of, of your journey to, um, you know, find out your, your worth within uh, this position, but also you are dealing with life and death. You're dealing with some of the hardest things. Uh, and the way you told that was so human and, and just funny. And I appreciate that. Oh, my goodness. 
so great. And our next storyteller is no stranger to speaking, but I am so happy to have her because this is the first time she is doing a personal story in this format. She is a teacher who in 2006 co-founded the Community Roots Charter School in Fort Greene and who currently serves the 475 students there in grades kindergarten to eighth. Uh, CRCS was founded to serve as a model of integration and inclusion and she has been awarded the Distinguished Service Award from Bank Street and helped found Roots Connected and currently serves as the board chair. Please welcome our next storyteller, Allison Kell, everybody. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to say thanks to my mom, Jason's Nana, and my stepfather who are here because I'm sitting in their beautiful apartment, not my own. If you work with me, um, or even if you're a family at our school, you know that I spend, when I am working from home, I have Wi-Fi issues each and every time. I'm constantly dropping off, moving to my phone. It's just a disaster. So tonight I'm here in this beautiful apartment and will not have Wi-Fi issues. So um, I think the first thing you need to know is I love my job. I love my job. I walk through this world with a lot of privilege and my job is at the center of that because I get so much joy from it. Um, and the things I love are I get to work with kids each and every day. I get to work with families each and every day. And I work with the most incredible set of human beings um, that are my team, my faculty, um, friends. Um, you should also know that I hate flying. I hate being on an airplane, but I love traveling. Um, go with me on this one. I'm gonna take you on a trip. We're gonna take off together and we're gonna land together. So the first 10 years of being a principal, it is a steep takeoff and it is a bumpy takeoff and you feel all the feels. You have so many moments of joy. You get to see kids have their little siblings. You get to see these moments of connections in your classrooms. You get to see your teachers who started with you as 20 something single people meet the person that they marry. You get to go to their weddings. You get to watch them become parents. It is such a privilege. And you have a front seat to all of that. You also get those moments that the, like the first moment in a year where it starts to snow and you're walking down the hallway of your school and all the doorways are open and you hear those little people start to cheer and you see them all get out of their seats and they run to the windows and you have moments like that constantly. And then you also have a front seat to all the trauma. So we don't run a big school. Our school is only 475 people, about 65 or 70 staff. But all those people together in that first 10 years, you experience and uh, are really close to a lot of trauma um, to people losing um, family members, to illness, um, to faculty needing to take leave. Um, and also for just a lot of really hard days, big and little people have a lot of hard days in 10 years. And you feel those feelings really big um, and what I notice about being a principal is those first 10 years, if we're back on that airplane and we're taking off, you're not in a simulation. There's no flight simulator there. And you're doing everything for real the first time. So the first time a kid falls and cuts their head open, you're making that call to that family. You're getting in the ambulance, you're going to the hospital and you're sitting there waiting for a parent to show up with a little person who's been hurt. And that's not a simulation. And those feelings are, are big. And during those 10 years, I worked 16 hour days um, every day. And so did almost everyone on my team. And I thought my insomnia was like, um, it, was a, it was a blessing because I just had more time to think and problem solve. Um, and it sort of worked for me. 
And that, that steep climb keeps going. But then around year 11, you know, when you're on that flight and things start, they level off. You're not climbing anymore. You sort of level off. And all of a sudden it feels like you're not moving, but you're, you're still moving 900 miles an hour. There's still a million things happening, but to you, you feel still. And year 11 to 14 kind of felt like on that cruising altitude. It's not that there isn't joy, there's so much joy and there's still so much trauma, but nothing's a first anymore. You're not experiencing anything as a first time. And so with that comes some, some calluses, uh, some numbing. And then I know all, I know we all remember March 14th and March 14th, 2020, I was in my 14th year of being a principal and I found myself on a call with my board of trustees. And it was as if we're on that flight and the captain is announcing we are heading into a big storm. Fasten your seatbelt. That was the time when our classrooms were super crowded. We were experiencing everything that we experience every March. We had a lot of sneezing. We had a lot of coughing. We had a lot of runny noses and we were all packed together. And that's when the mayor started announcing that week what he was closing. He was closing gatherings over 50 people. He was closing down Broadway. He was closing down lots of things but not public schools. And it was Saturday and I was speaking to my board and it was a really, really long call. And we finally decided, you know what? This bureaucracy does not have the best interest of our kids and our families and our faculty at the forefront. And we're just gonna pull the plug. We're gonna say, we're gonna close school on Monday and we're not gonna wait for them to do it. So all day Saturday, my leadership team works. We work on the communication plan. We work on how we're going to rationalize making this decision. And then on Sunday morning, we wake up and the mayor says that schools will be temporarily closed. And he gives a week and he says, uh, you have a week before you start remote instruction. And it was as if on that plane, we're like, we're making an emergency landing. And we are going to stop for one week and we are going to rebuild the plane. And so in that week, there was so much to get done. So we run a, a school that's, that feels like a family. So it wasn't about the numbers, it's about kids and families that you know so well. And we knew that every kid needed a laptop and that was just the beginning. And the operations team had to make that happen. And then we had to, learn how to teach. We had to choose platforms. Um, we had to help faculty get used to those new platforms. And there was so much training and so much communication and it was one week and then it was time to take off again. So we did, we did take off again. Um, and I know that now, like in hindsight, it feels like we just that this is what we do, we do remote school. But I can tell you at that time, that was not what we did. And I felt like my job when we opened again was to be that person on the plane saying, fasten your seatbelts, we're gonna get there, it's gonna be okay, and we're gonna steady this flight. We're not gonna make any rash decisions, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna do this. And that was like my daily mantra on that plane ride. And we did it and we started studying. And then uh, on May, 20, May 25th, uh, the news of George Floyd's murder um, became national news and that video and that brutality was circulated. And I had a moment on that plane ride where I just thought, I can't, I'm not prepared. I cannot be a school leader in this moment. I cannot be a white school leader in this moment. And I cannot lead this community in any way through our nation finally recognizing the brutality against black lives in our country. And we did come together and we did create space 
we were slow to do it and it wasn't perfect, but we created space for people to connect. We created spaces for kids to learn um, and to begin to reconnect to what our school was developed to do, which is to recognize injustice, to take action and to become social activists. And we kept doing it. And then the end of the year was approaching and New York City was sick and getting sicker. And at the same time, we had to both um, for the first time have virtual graduation. So simultaneously, we planned a fifth grade graduation. We planned an eighth grade graduation. And we also planned a day of action and reflection and education um, for the Black Lives Matter movement. And it was a stormy, stormy, turbulent ride. And then that June 26 came and we landed the plane. And that, that time would normally be a time when educators uh, breathe and take time to rejuvenate and reconnect with their passions. And I know that that's something that I have always had the privilege to do. But this summer was not that. Um, so this summer, it was um, this. My board looked at our leadership team and they said, they recognized the depletion in us and they said, you need to take some time off. And we looked at them and we said, we don't have time, but we did. We took four days off and it was um, then taking off again. This time it was like taking off in that fog, you know, when you're on the airplane and you are just in like deep, dark fog and that feeling of July and August was like flying through the deepest, darkest fog you can imagine and knowing at any moment you're gonna hit that bump and you're gonna grab your armrest because you're gonna lurch. Because at that time, the job was rebuild the plane with all new parts, add these levels of compliance that I didn't even understand um, and take out all of the things that make school what school should be. So take out the hugging and the communal snacks and the connecting and the holding hands, take all of that out and add PPE policies, add um, health checks, add uh, nine kids in a room, add how they're gonna go to the bathroom because they can't go to the bathroom whenever they want because then there's gonna be, talk about pods, wait, not pods. So, so much different compliance coming at us that it just felt like we were flying through, dodging sort of um, the turbulence as we went. And at that moment, I was back to those 16 hour days of the first 10 years. Um, I was back to 16 hour days. I was back to reconnecting with my insomnia and recognizing that that is, um, somewhat of a gift because those ideas that you come up with in the middle of the night when the puzzle feels impossible to put together. So how can you both center what faculty needs and what family needs and rebuild school in this insane way? And I was back to those feelings. So those calluses were stripped off and I was back to sort of feeling everything and being really, really, really overwhelmed. But we did do it. We, we did submit the reopening plan. We did communicate. We did have lots of meetings with faculty and lots of meetings with families. And we presented a plan and we made it up. And then September 21st came. And September 21st was the first day we opened school for some kids and some faculty to be in school together. And we went down to the recess yard. The recess yard is one of those, my favorite places to be. And we had our new protocols in our brains and we had our thermometers in hand and we put on our gloves. And I went to that recess gate. And the first thing I saw was a 
tons of families lined up all with their masks. And I could tell just seeing their eyes that they were smiling. And then the first little person came in and I got to say, can I take your temperature? And they were like, yeah. And I could see their little faces smiling under their little masks. And for the first time, I realized that we could do it. In fact, that the writing of it and the planning for it wasn't what it was about. And we had all the leaves on the recess yard and the kids knew how to socially distance and we just went and did it. And it was one of those moments where it's like, you just recognize that like the, the, the compliance part of it is the part of my job that I can't stand, but there's so many parts of my job that I love and that moment of seeing those little people and those little masks was very similar to me of walking over off that plane when you've had such a turbulent flight. And if you're someone like me, you're so anxious that entire time you're kind of in this like damp sweat, but then you get off in some place you've never been and you smell that sweet, sweet air and you feel still a little bit queasy, but you're so excited for that next adventure. And that's what that felt like to me. So thank you. Oh, yes, yes. Allison, Allison, I'm doing everything. I'm doing crazy waving and clapping <laughs> at the same time. Uh, yeah, you know, I, wow. Um, it's so, uh, I haven't heard I've heard a lot of different perspectives, but I haven't heard it, you know, it put all together like you did in this one story. And I really like the plane metaphor. Uh, I was thinking it's like uh, the from the remote schooling and having to do all this reorganizing. It was like you guys also had to build the plane while it was in the air, which um, seems a little unfair. I would say it seems a little challenging. Uh, and yeah, um, you know, I have, I have a five-year-old, of course, kindergarten has been a thing. And I, sometimes I forget how, I mean, there's like a little bit of a joke with me and my therapist. <laughs> I, sometimes I say my friend, but I'll be honest, it's my therapist, uh, where she will say to me, little kids are so resilient. And I'll be like, well, then why am I here talking about my childhood? You know, we'll just go back and forth on that. Uh, but my five-year-old you know, he has a mask on and we were going to the school, the in-person day. And I said to him in a, a way to an adult way, I said, uh, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Like just all of my stuff was coming out. And he, he is, he just looked at me and he goes, why wouldn't I be okay? Why wouldn't I be okay? And I was like, oh, gotta be so grateful for that. He was like, I'm going to school. Why wouldn't I be okay? So yeah, hearing your story, just especially when you were just talking about seeing all the kids come in the gate uh, on that day with the smiling eyes, that is that is exactly it. So amazing. All right, we have one final storyteller, everybody. Our final storyteller has been moving to a political drum of late, trying to assure a future where black bodies are not the targets and black lives are not second rate. And storytelling, of course, is a huge part of that. Please welcome our final storyteller, Valerie Walker, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, so it's very intimidating to be going last after this, this group of sharing because it's been very inspirational and very dope. I am a, a breast cancer survivor. These are not my boobs, but I claim them. They're kind of cute. Um, and also, I was a middle school teacher for many, many, many years, um, and now I'm an education director for an after-school program, so I sort of know both the plight of the teacher and the administrator. Um, and having heard your stories, now I want to share all these different stories, but I will share the story that um, I'm going to do to today, which is actually a story I told the first time I ever um, got up on the stage at the MOF. So here goes. So sometimes history has a way of speaking directly to you, to your heart. And it can leave a mark, an indelible etch that becomes a part of you. And sometimes it manifests itself into a thought or an idea or a way of being that you wouldn't have had without it. And Ruby Bridges 
had that effect on me. And she was a big part of why I became a school teacher. So at the age of six, Ruby Bridges desegregated a public elementary school in Louisiana in 1960, all by herself. I first heard about her when my teacher read her story out loud in my fourth grade class, and I was fascinated with her. I was in awe of her bravery. And what she was doing was deemed so dangerous that US Marshals were flown in to escort her safely to and from school. And I was struck by her determination because she spent mo most of that first year in class alone because the parents of the other white students refused to let their kids be educated in a class with a Negro. And I could kind of relate because fast forward almost two decades later, and I was the only white, I was the only black kid in my all white class um, that was academically accelerated in um, predominantly white Staten Island. So I could relate to her. She saw education as her way out and I was determined for it to be my way out as well. I learned like Ruby learned and loved to learn and thirsted to learn more. So it's not a big surprise that I became a school teacher. And Ruby was with me then because every year in my classroom, I had a copy of the portrait that Norman Rockwell had painted of her on the wall in my class. It's called The Problem We All Live With. And I would use it to start a civics discussion with my students talking about the difference between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. So fast forward to 2019, I've moved outside of the classroom setting onto a more social justice uh, sort of mindset. And now I work with young brown and black people in detention in Brooklyn. So think jail for adolescents. They are the hardest to reach of the hardest to reach. I was sent to Tennessee for a week long training to learn um, the principles of a, a school system called Freedom School to then bring those skills back to the young men that I work with. And it was the end of a very long week of 12 hour days made longer by nightly homework assignments. And I was hangry and I just wanted to go home. But we had one more um, big gathering, the closing ceremonies. And so I was in a room with about 3000 people much in the same state as I was. And I was slumped forward in my chair when I think I hear the person at the podium say Ruby Bridges. And all of a sudden a bolt of electricity like went through me and I'm sitting up, Ruby Bridges. Did they just say Ruby Bridges? I tapped the arm of the person next to me. Did they just say Ruby Bridges? But they don't know. And so I look down and I find a discarded program on the floor and I look at it and oh my God, it is my Ruby Bridges. And immediately my eyes welled up with tears and I begin to silently cry. She comes out on the stage and takes the podium. And my first thought was how young she looked. I, I really was like, damn, black don't crack. And then she spoke eloquently about, not so much about what she endured, although she did give some more um, imagery that I did, stuff I wasn't aware of, like the US Marshals that were flown in um, behind the car that she was in with the Marshals was every black member of her town. Also walking her to school to make sure that she got there safely. And I just thought that, wow, that was such a beautiful and powerful image. And it was a necessary thing because the white people in that town were very against this and brought their angry A-game. In fact, she talked about one protester who had gotten a black baby doll and fashioned a coffin around it for a six-year-old girl. So she, a lot of people, sadly, in the audience didn't even know who she was. So she didn't stay with the history lesson. She actually 
talked about the amazing freedoms that everybody had today to affect change and how she challenged us all to do just that as a way to pay it back. At the end of her speech, the moderator said that there would be time for one or two questions. And I shot up in the air like a cannonball from a cannon, hand raised high up in the air on my tippy, tippy, tippy toes. I was so determined to talk to my hero that I wasn't even aware that I started mouthing, pick me, pick me until I started noticing the people around me pointing to me and saying, pick her. And they did pick me. And as I made my way up to the side of the stage where they had directed us to go to ask a question, I was transformed back into my nine-year-old self when I first heard about her. I thought of all the things that I wanted to ask her and what I was incredibly curious about. And the tears started again. Now, I don't know what the first question was that she was asked or what she even replied. I just remember that when she was done with, that, with her answer, she turned and she looked at me kindly. And I sort of wondering, you know, you know, crying, talking. I thanked her for her incredible act of defiance that directly led the way for me to graduate from an Ivy League institution. I thanked her for inspiring me to become a teacher and for the role that she played annually in my classroom. And then I asked her the two questions I had really been burning to ask her since forever. I, was, I asked her, was that white teacher kind to you? And did you love having the teacher all to yourself? Because I was such a super nerd when I was a kid that that just sounded to me like Nirvana. And so she took a moment, took a beat, and she actually thanked me because she said that in the course of her career, she had never been asked those questions. And it allowed her to give more of an idea of what that time was like for her. Because yes, that teacher was kind to her. And it was in sharp contrast to the behavior of the white people outside. And so it was the first time in her life that she really began to understand that you cannot tell a book by its cover. Because the woman in the classroom looked the same as the protesters outside, but she treated her very differently. And so she knew she could not just make judgments based on what people look like. She would have to do more research. And as for whether she had, uh, enjoyed having that teacher to herself, the answer to that was a resounding yes. She said it was like learning while playing, which she very much enjoyed. And then she went on to thank me uh, and said that I was an inspiration to her. Now, I don't remember much that happened <laughs> or that was said after that because, you know, I completely blacked out in my mind because my hero was saying that I was an inspiration to her. It's crazy. Um, but as I was walking back to my seat, I began to think about the young men that I worked with back at the detention center. And I wanted to be able to impart to them what I was feeling in this moment, how history was talking to me and how I got a chance to talk back and how I felt inspired and, and energetic and I was no longer hangry and I was no longer tired and overwhelmed. I was excited to get back and, and, and to start beginning building these connections through the Freedom School methodology so that I could bring this experience in some way to my kids. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Valerie, Valerie, uh, you know, you started that story by saying it's uh, this is, you know, basically a tough act to follow, which uh, but the, the perfect closer, the perfect closer with just such an incredible story, uh, both um, uh, unfortunately timely uh, and poignant and heartfelt and just unbelievably inspiring. So thank you so much. What 
an evening, everybody. This is uh, this is the best Saturday night I've had in a long time. Thank you so much to our storytellers. Big, big round of applause again for all of our storytellers. Just incredible.